Hi, it's repair time, the classic IBM PC Junior keyboard. Now this uh, comes from my old uh, IBM PC Junior teardown video and where I got that um, partially up and running. I'll link in both of those videos, main channel and a second channel video if you haven't seen it. It's a rather interesting and in-depth teardown of probably the most uh, successful failure in IBM's history, the IBM PC Junior. Anyway, um, this keyboard didn't work. It, it actually, it's an infrared wireless uh, keyboard. I've already, yes, I've already taken it apart a bit. Infrared wireless keyboard, but it's also got a wired connection as well. Now the wired connection was causing the uh, computer not to boot up. So um, yeah, it's a problem. And I've tried to put the batteries in there. I've tried it. The computer works, but the wireless uh, keyboard doesn't either wired or wireless. So I thought we'd uh, take it apart, have a look. Of course, all the yellowings happened and from people using it, it's all, you know, the smooth edge down here and all the uh, rest of it. So let's uh, take a look in inside here it's got I mentioned this in my previous video probably the worst designed uh, battery holder I've ever seen uh, with the rails in there and you have gotta slide the batteries under it's just really really bad anyway let's take this thing apart and let's have a squiz inside and ta-da that's why people hated it is because it's a rubber membrane keyboard it's not a proper IBM keyboard look at that but it, you know, I, I think it feels okay. There's nothing hugely wrong with it. Um, I, I won't, uh, I won't take all that out. Anyway, I think it's okay. What we're looking at is the main board. There's something wrong with this. Now, the first thing you may not notice it, but I can, I can just bend that board like that. That is not a 1.6 millimeter PCB because you wouldn't be able to bend a 1.6 millimeter PCB that big like that. That's 0.8 millimeter. Piece of, why they've used a 0.8 millimeter PCB? Why? Why to give it a little bit of give when you push down on a key? I don't. Unbelievable! Not a huge amount of stuff on here. Just some uh, 4000 series uh, CMOS. You want it to be at uh, low power, of course. Uh, the main processor 80C48, which was uh, a common mask programmable. None of that flash or uh, E squared prom rubbish. It was a one-time programmable. Very common in the IBM keyboard. In fact. Keyboards today still have the 8040, 80C48, don't they? I think so. Anyway, um, just some, you know, 4066s. Uh, oh, I've got a 74HC03 in there, and there's not much else. We've got our infrared uh, LEDs there, and yes, I've actually uh, checked it because you can actually hold up any infrared remote control up to a video camera like I'm using at the moment and it'll be able to, the sensor in the video camera will be able to see the LEDs uh, flash and they don't flash. So Houston, we have a problem. So first thing, uh, first like visuals of course, it looks okay. The caps aren't leaking, uh, there's nothing else in there really. Um, so we'll power it up with a lab power supply. We'll set that at 6 volts, 100 milliamp current limit because, well, you know, it shouldn't draw more than 100 milliamps. I'm pretty sure I've got that around the right way. You can see the uh, negative pointed uh, towards there, so that looks correct. Uh, looks like we've got some diode protection there, so let's, uh, let's power that up and see what, what's what. That's good. It's only drawing 4 milliamps, that's what you'd expect. Okay, I'm shorting some of those pads out and I don't see the current changing. I would have expected the current to go up because it would have uh, be driving the LEDs. So, uh, and of course, first thing first, thou shall measure voltages. So ground and power on our micro, 5.8 volts. Well, that's all right. Um, it, this, because it's a CMOS uh, version, it's an, it can go up to six volts. So that's all right. And check to see that we've got a clock. Yep, six megahertz, no worries. All right, so what I did is look for a uh, schematic for this thing. Unfortunately, I can't find it. They do have an awesome technical reference manual for this, and they also have a um, hardware repair service manual as well. Unfortunately, that doesn't actually contain the schematics. Um, but I did found, find something useful in the manual. It said when you plug in the keyboard, it actually disables the infrared transmitter. So obviously our process is running, because this is not an oscillator, so uh, it's just a crystal. So the oscillator needs to be running in the processor. So it's running and it's doing something. So when you plug it in, there's a signal apparently that disables the infrared, which would explain it. So 
I'm just going to give this a, uh, a nice visual. I'm not going to do it on the screen here. I'll go look at it under the microscope just to see if there's any funny business. See if there's any, are there any pins shorted out inside there. Um, I'm just uh, probing the pins here. Found a 400 uh, kilohertz signal there. So obviously um, the chip is doing something. So, so it's not like it's dead. I can get some pins to vary when I touch some of the pads. But uh, apart from that, getting zippity doo dah. If I short it out, we can get get this, all the switchy bounce. But no matter what I do, I can't get it to actually trigger the infrared LED output. So I, I don't know what the deal is. And I'm getting no signal on the uh, keyboard either, like any of the keyboard lines. Oop, that was just a staticky impulse. And we get this little wiggly signal here on the uh, power rail. But if you see, we're one microsecond per division. Count the rough number of cycles in there. And there's six. Six megahertz. We've got a six megahertz crystal. That's just, yeah, like lack of bypassing on the uh, rail. So nothing doing there. Okay, apart from the uh, 400 kilohertz on one of these pins, there is absolutely no activity on any other pin on that micro. I've checked every pin when I'm like activating a button like this. And like there's no scanning, there's no nothing. So I've just got the clock, 6 megahertz clock, and a 400 kilohertz uh, signal on one of those pins. And that's it. I'm going to, I don't know, trace that 400 kilohertz, see where it goes. And of course, it went to the very last chip that I scanned, because you go around and you scan all the pins like this with power off, of course. And I finally get across here, and bingo, got it. <laughs> last one, bloody Murphy. And here's where your uh, studio lights come in handy. You can see right through the board, because uh, some of these, like I can't see, I couldn't actually trace that uh, 400 kilohertz uh, signal out of there, so it went up here somewhere. Couldn't see it, and I can't see where this pin goes because it's on the top side. It buggers off under here somewhere. Well, that's interesting. I hooked the board back up, having a poke oak, and it's now drawing nothing. So it was drawing four milliamps before. Now it's drawing bugger all. What? Wow. This is interesting. Some sort of intermittent fault. Uh, we're getting 5 volts on our chippy, but we're getting nothing on our oscillator anymore. All that 400 kilohertz signal. Of course, we're not going to get the 400 if the main oscillator's not working. The oscillator's dead. The micro's getting 5 volts. Interesting. I just replaced the crystal with another 6 megahertz one, and we're back up to 4 milliamps, and it's we're back to our oscillator. So, uh dodgy intermittent crystal but that wouldn't explain why the keyboard's not working though okay so we're back to it let's follow the money this is this 400 kilohertz signal and we don't get any variation in that when we do the keys so if we follow the money it actually goes down to in, in, including the chip up here goes down to this resistor pack here so it's a 104 and on the other side nothing hmm Let's trace where the other side goes to. I think it goes to this uh, 74HCO3 here. But why? You get a signal on one side of a 10K resistor and not on the other? Maybe it's a pull-up. Aha! Uh -huh. That's... I thought this was a through resistor like that, like individual ones. It's not uh, 104 is 100K. And sure enough, if we measure... I've powered it off. Measure across there, 200K... 200k like that, which means one of them's common. It's probably this one up here. Yep, 100k, 100k, yeah, 100k common. Okay, so that's just a pull up. So it's not going through a resistor to there. That's just a pull up on that 400 kilohertz line. That's okay. Okay, there was nothing wrong with that crystal because I turned this thing off and on and I'm still, it's gone back like it's failed again. So it's gone back. So what I'm going to do is just, I'm going to look at my current display. And just give that a, a bendy bend. Like that. No, nah, my current just stays on zero. So we've got an intermittent startup. Jeez, I hate these things. When you get intermittent problems like this, it just makes troubleshooting a real pain. Okay, so next thing I'm going to do is trace the uh, reset line of the micro, which is pin 4, and see if it's uh, getting a reset. I got lucky this time. I was just dragging along there. And it's connected to pin uh, 7 there of this 4011 and then I trace that over goes over to this via which goes up to pin 1 
of this 4013 up here again. Jeez, it's going everywhere, man. And it goes off to another pin, this 4013. So that 4013 is pretty important. Then you might think, oh, okay, there's some sort of RC uh, thing happening, but there's nothing like you scan over all the passives. Good thing about through hole like this. And just scan across and like there's nothing so there's no like rc uh like uh, reset thing at least not directly right so at this point it starts to get a little bit ugly without the uh, schematic you know it's almost as if like you're starting to reverse engineer this okay the the micro is not starting up so you look at the reset pin where's the reset pin going oh it's going to over to a couple of chips uh, pins over here of this gate and so without a schematic you go well what do i do you know like suck out the 4013 and uh test that <laughs> get out an old school ic tester geez that'd be fun and when you power it on the reset line is permanently low like that so there's something forcing that reset line load and the it's drawing naff all because it's in static condition they're all cmos and maybe i should have traced this but just for kicks i uh sucked it out and all the pins are bent over so you've got it with your solder sucker gun you've got to sort of like bend them up and then you've got to get in there and you've got to just give them a little bit of wiggle 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 yeah and uh should pop out nice no pads lifted no nothing beauty yeah, we can get an old school like well it's not an old school one because i actually designed an ic tester way back we're talking 25 years ago or something it doesn't work anymore but uh, i have one that does let's go it's the upgraded one to that i originally had it's the tl8662 plus at zgecu.com anyway um it's got an ic tester built in so check this out it's got logic ic's and devices 4013 which is exactly what we have place it in the socket i have let's press test and test normal test normal test normal oh test normal wah, 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 wah. well i ruled that out i like i don't know how comprehensively it tests it but it knows that there's x gates in there and it, i assume it exercises all options for all the stuff so yeah um Oh, okay. I'll tell you what, just for kicks, I decided to start this thing back up without the chip in there. And yes, it oscillates now. We're getting that uh, 400 kilohertz that we're getting before. And I thought that I'd just probe the lead over here and then just do the shorty short thing. We're actually getting tra uh, packet transmission. There we go. Look, we're now sending data. We're sending data without the chip. Wow, look at that. Something's going on there. The so signal level is just, that's the voltage drop of the uh, lead there, the infrared lead um, from the positive rail. Wow, I might actually see if the keyboard actually talks to the PC now. I, I've removed the chip. This is hilarious. I, I, like, I thought I'd just start up. I just, just for kicks, I thought I'd do that. This is hilarious. Okay, I'm just going hacky hack like this. And uh, no, it doesn't seem to be doing anything. So, you know, like the, the 4013 could have something to do with the encoding, of course. All right, don't try this at home, kiddies. But what I'm going to do is put my meter in uh, the microamp range. And I'm actually going to short out the reset pin. The chip's back in there now. Soldered it back in. It, it, it doesn't work. We're back to our original uh, configuration. It's drawing 4 milliamps and, and yeah. Oh, no. Jeez, it just it started drawing zero again. Ah, oh, give me a break. All right, it's working again. I just kept powering it up and mucking around with it until uh, it drew four milliamps instead of oh, it's dropped to zero again. I just bumped it. <sighs> What's going on? Okay, I might have sussed it. If I hold a key down, uh, like short one out when I'm powering it up, it seems to come good. Anyway, I'm not going to worry about that now. What I want to do, okay, so I'm going to probe my lead here and don't try this at home kiddies but i'm going to put my meter on uh current uh mode so just uh mic ramps here and i'm going to short out that reset line because that reset line pin four here is currently low so it's keeping the processor in reset and if you read the data sheet the oscillator does actually start up in that mode so the oscillator is uh, actually running but it's obviously, but it can't execute its program, obviously. Okay, so what I'm going to do is hold that uh, 
pin, the reset pin, I'm going to actually force it to the positive rail here. It's drawn an extra 6 milliamps on my power supply. Sorry, you can't see that, but... So we're forcing it to operate, and look! You saw that? We're now getting data on our scope. So now I forced it out of reset mode, and it seems to be doing the business, working, sending the packets. So obviously, um, this thing is being held in reset mode. So we've got to figure out why. It has to do with the 4013. It's flippity flop time. By the way, I've never heard of sync semiconductories wise componentes. Um, <laughs> what? Anyway, um, <laughs> I got no idea. Is that, that, that like Spanish or something? I, I, sorry, I got no idea. Anyway, never heard of them. It, uh, it just first one that pulled up when I searched for PDF. Anyway, um, all I know is that uh, the Q1 uh, output of the flippity flop here uh, that goes to our uh, not reset line of our processor that's what's staying low so it needs to go high in order to, for this thing to work and that's actually tied to pin 9 which is uh, the second data pin of this flippity flop here I haven't traced anything else this is where the schematic uh, would be yeah really quite handy. Anyway, we're going to uh, check our, see that our inputs here. I'll just try and uh, single shot capture some of these like uh, clock, for example, when we power it on. So this is our uh, clock signal. This is when it was uh, powering down like this. So power's on. We There's no extra clock in there, but uh, we don't know. We haven't time correlated that against the power on. So, uh, yeah, we need to do that. This is where you need a two-channel scope. Oh, lucky I got one. So I traced out uh, pin 3, the clock line there. It goes to Q4 of the 4060, which is down here. And that's a good old uh, binary ripple counter here. And, uh, yeah, so that's a Q4 output. Aha! Is so obviously I mean, this is maybe some power on delay or something uh, for the reset that they're doing. So I'm going to now focus on the 4060. I'm not going to bother uh, checking the rest of this anymore. If if we're not getting a clock in there, which is uh, the well, there's two ways to change your output here. Your reset, you can use your set and your reset pin. But what's the point anyway? So but the fact that the clock goes off to this ripple counter tells me that this ripple counter is important, probably some power on timer or something else that um, is, is not working. So, so just a quick check of the cap down in there. It's going to be that smaller one, not the yellow one. That'll be the bypass. 10 nanofarads. All right. And I measured those two resistors in there as well. They're uh, bang on, as close bang on as they will be uh, in circuit. So that's not a problem. 10 nanofarads sounds about right. Um, yeah. Okay, so the 4060 is a, a binary ripple counter, of course. Doesn't have a, none of that uh, Q0 to Q2 rubbish. Don't need that. And uh, it basically, you can hook up an external crystal or an RC, typically, and in this case, an RC oscillator on here. But the master reset pin will disable that. I've checked uh, pin 9 for any oscillation. There is no oscillation. I've checked pin 12. What do you know? It's high. So it's an active high input. So... This thing ain't working. No wonder uh, that no oscillation. That means no clock on Q5, which means no flippy floppy action over here to change your reset, to toggle your reset pin. Aha. What's happening to the reset here? Okay, I've done a little bit more tracing here. And this uh, reset pin, it goes off to this uh, NAND gate here, the 4011. That's a baby next to it there. And this bugger's off. I <laughs> goofed it the first time. Um, this goes through a cap and a resistor over to the keyboard connector over here. So you remember how we had uh, mentioned before how it had some sort of plug-in detection and disabled the, uh, the LEDs on here? Well, I, I think there might be some plug-in contact in there. So you have a look inside there. Focus, you bastard. There's those little lever things in there. Maybe one of those is not making contact when it should. Hmm, when it's not plugged in. Worth a shot. I think we're getting somewhere because this buggers off to an internal switch, a plug-in switch inside the keyboard connector, which goes up to plus 5 volts. So watch this. This is the connector on the side of the pin there. So there you go, we're getting our 5 volts. 
Sorry, it's hard to see that, but that's basically on the output side of the that RC there. If I get in there and I disconnect that, like I'm plugging in the connector, boom, it goes to zero, and then it goes to five. It's got a little uh, lever switch in there that detects the uh, plug-in. But that seems to be working, actually. All right, something's going on here. If I look at pin one, let's measure the voltage on pin one here. 2.2 volts. Wah, 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 wah. That's smack in the undefined region of the CMOS gate. No wonder the output's uh, going to be doing silly buggers. Well, the output's high, which is forcing our uh, reset. And what's pin two doing? Pin two is high as well. So it should be low. So they're both, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> something's wrong there. There you go. Well, that's supposed to be a 2.2 mic. Um, that's a, just a little... Uh, one of those uh, bugger tantalums, um, but it measures okay. Yeah, confirmed. That's okay. Something else. And hold on to your hats because I've uh, left that capacitor out. I've repowered it up to uh, have a play around with it. And you're going to have to see my power supply for this. I haven't uh, used the scope to look at anything, but it's drawing no current at the moment. But if I short out a key... Bingo! It draws NAF all, like microamps. That's probably until you press a key. Maybe that's what you'd expect. So all along, the 4 milliamps, we could have been coming to Gutsa. Anyway, I think she's working now. Okay, so what I care about now, let's just turn it on. And Bob's your uncle. Now we're transmitting. So, uh, yeah, I could go into the intricacies of how or why. I mean, this cap seems to be okay. Um, I don't think it's leakage is a uh, an issue, but um, anyway, uh, well, it could be. Oh, no, no, look, it sort of like stays on. Five. Oh, and then it drops back down, but maybe that's, it could be some power down state or something. There you go, it's actually drawing uh, 65 microamps there, which is, uh, that's kind of what you'd expect for a keyboard, isn't it? Four, I should have tweaked to that. <laughs> People are probably screaming at me, yeah, four milliamps, that's a lot. Well, you know, double A's, but still, you know, it would have been sucking the juice. And we'll put it in uh, max mode and 50 milliamp range there. So it's peaking at about 8 odd milliamps there to drive the LEDs. Winner, winner, chicken dinner. <laughs> it works. Our wireless keyboard with no cap. It may not actually be the cap, maybe something else, but the cap is making it work. So uh, via that uh, silly plug in uh, keyboard switch thing. Hang on, the story's not over yet. Take, take a look at this. This is our reset pin is still low. But when we touch a key, it wakes up. Go down. Can I get it to stay on? Can I get it to latch on? Sometimes I can get it. There we go. It's latched on. And 5.7 volts, so it's high. And then, whoop, goes, and it goes low. Huh. Brown, black, green. You all know what that is. High value jobby. And look. Those two pins are shorted. This is where I've removed the cap from. There's nothing, look, over this side here, they're not connected to anywhere. Yet, if I measure that resistor, wow, what? 170K? What the? Well, I found it remarkable that a one meg carbon film resistor could fail. And sure enough, it hasn't. Have I missed a trace on the PCB? Oh yeah, look at that. You can easily come a gut so I couldn't see it under the resistor. Right angle trace. Look at that. <laughs> it was hidden by the resistor. Mongrel. Okay, I've just uh, soldered in a uh, ceramic jobby over here. It's not 2.2, but it's near enough. Good enough for Australia. It doesn't have to be that. And we're getting our thing again. This seems to be like, if you, I think if you do the keys quick, it sort of like latches on like that. I think there's something wrong with that cap. Even though it measures okay, it could be some uh, voltage uh, dependency issue on there. And yep, there we have it at 6 volts. Got 150 microamps leakage. So combine that with our 1 meg resistor and you're going to come a gutser. And that's why we're getting that uh, mid-rail voltage that we were seeing. So leaky tantalum. <laughs> Doesn't have to be much. But when you combine it with that, it's just the design of having that 1 meg resistor down in there. It's Kamigatsa. There you go. <laughs> now it's jumped up to 190. It's all over the shop, actually. If I change the voltage, is there a point where it drops to naff all? Nah. Leaky bloody tantalum. Unbelievable. Well, it's not. <laughs> They're notorious for it.
So there you have it. Winner, winner, chicken dinner. It was a little tantalum, not one of those tag tans, one of those uh, axial tantalums, that a leaky tantalum. And when you look back on it, uh, even without the complete schematic, little bit of reverse engineering we did, is that uh, it was, yeah, that would explain it. A leaky tan in there was causing a non-valid uh, logic level in here. This was probably oscillating, doing all sorts of funny things, and that went to the reset, which and it buggered everything up. So that explains while I was uh, seeing those, like it, it'd sometimes be drawing four milliamps. That was probably due to the oscillation or something like that, doing something weird. And then it had, when it went, went into zero, um, maybe when it actually went to zero, it would have worked if I happened to have tested it at that exact point. But it's like, <laughs> it's just all, all over the shop. So that explained all the intermittent operation and how we chased a red herring down a rabbit hole there a bit you know it seems this is what's this video like 30 minutes or something it seemed like a long time doing this and it might be there's some things in here that i wouldn't have done i was just doing it for the sake of the video like sucking out the chip and just wanted to use the ic tester and show you that you know like it's, it's not something i would have ordinarily uh done and you could have said oh if you reverse engineered it from the get-go it would have been a little bit quicker maybe but all up like if i wasn't shooting a video for for this it, it's not a, a not a really long repair yeah it was a, a pain in the butt to get to that point you had to go through most of those processes i went through unless you got you know lucky in some other way uh to track that down to the axial uh tent on there and some people might have gone oh yeah i, I would have replaced the axial tent from the get-go <laughs> okay well you know <laughs> we were methodically going through testing everything but that was an absolute classic i hope you enjoyed that as much as i did i love it when i get faults like this that take some time to track down and they come down to you know that cap if you test it on your meter or your um, LCR meter, it, it measures fine, but it's actually leaky, and that might not ordinarily be a problem. This cap could still work in many, many other circuits, but when you combine it with the one meg resistor in there, you're going to come a gutter. So, oh, look, yeah, it's just, it, it's all over the shop. <laughs> That's hopeless. Anyway, that was fascinating, so I hope you really enjoy that. Love it when I get repairs like that, and it's not very often. If you did enjoy it, please give it a big thumbs up, and as always, discuss down below. Catch you next time. Oh, and by the way, uh, this repair came about because I was actually trying another thing which involves this monitor over here. So I was in the middle of shooting that video. I was most of the way through it and I uh, wanted to get this PC Junior working. I thought, oh, get that. I, I want to get the keyboard working. And uh, so I had to go at that. And yeah, one thing led to another. So this video comes out first. <sighs> Catch you next time. Hello.